Welcome, my Saturday night friends. I'm glad to see you and thank you for being here and being a part of my life. These daily meetups are selfishly also for me. <laughs> so I am, I am glad to have you guys be a part. Um, our guest tonight is supposed to be near Ale. I don't know if he's coming later or not coming at all. So we will play it by ear regardless. I will still talk about the principles of his book if he doesn't show um, because it's always worth talking about. So I want to start tonight's meeting with some thoughts on personal responsibility and accountability during this time because the world is on its head for sure. And I think, I know personally, it's been really easy for me to sort of have the mentality of everything is falling apart. I feel really scared and nervous and I'm just going to go to my nearest coping mechanism, which for me is food. Um, and I understand that. I mean, I feel that with every bit of my being, this like low boiling sense of dread <laughs> that's like something is um, gonna go very wrong because the whole world is different. Our world today is different than it was three weeks ago. And we're all very nervous. And I know, oh, there's Nir. Hi, he's joining now. And I know that I feel very nervous and I want to feel comfort and I want to feel like everything's going to be okay. And so it's really easy to turn to those coping mechanisms. But I want to point out the personal responsibility that we all have in our current situation. Yes, there's stuff we can't control. <laughs> But there's also this crab bucket mentality. And I don't know if you guys have, have heard that when you're in a bucket of crabs and one tries to escape, all the other crabs try and pull it down. And so in this crab bucket mentality, where especially right now, um, we're trying to um, stay above water and everyone's trying to tell us, um, you know, worry, freak out, you know, act crazy. Like that's what you're seeing on the TV, right? Is, is a constant stream of that. And so we have this personal responsibility to try and ground ourselves. And however we do that is up to us. And however we comfort ourselves has to try and be some sort of healthier coping mechanism than perhaps we were used to, or we're going to find ourselves beating ourselves up. And it's not, and I'm telling you what you should do. It's just, these are the things we, we know. And that's why I'm super excited about Nir being on tonight because his theme, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, Hi, so um, I'm very excited you're here. It's morning where you are, right? It is, yes, it yes, is, early good, morning over good. here. Well, happy morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, good evening. <laughs> yes, good evening. Yeah, I was just talking about um, sort of our personal responsibility and and how we, what we choose to give our attention to and what we choose to give our awareness to and how right now is a really difficult time. And I thought your book, especially, especially now is so timely and, and such a great talking point for where we can learn to be indistractable and focus on what is important and the things that we need to be doing right now. So thank you for being a part of this. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I, I uh, I was just saying the other day about how, man, I'm glad that this book was published when it was, uh, because if it was necessary before this whole mess, man, it's even <laughs> more necessary right. as we're trying to figure out how, how to work from home, how to work from home while kids are at home learning uh, and trying to homeschool. It's uh, it's a very, very distracting time. Oh, thank you for Kristen for has the book right there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have it. It's just on Kindle. But oh, I, always, oh, I always feel bad when I have authors on. I'm like, oh, I have it on Kindle, but I always show them. I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I'm an author. I'm like, yeah, you got it on Kindle. You show me. <laughs> um, but I read this book. So actually my good friend, Todd, who's on, he um, told me, he's like, you got to read this book, Indistractable. And I said, why? <laughs> why do I need to? I'm, I have great focus. He's like, no, no, you need to read it. And I read it like on three days on the Stairmaster because that's when I do my Kindle reading and and then I think I sent you an email with a screenshot of my iPhone <laughs> um, home screen because one of your techniques in there I had utilized and I said see I followed your advice and I would like to have you on my podcast 
<laughs> and you said yes, which was awesome. But let's talk a little bit about this. Um, the subtitle of your book is How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And that's exactly what I was talking about. This is the time for us to choose. We have choices. So let's start there. How to control your yeah. attention. Yeah, so so this is really what I call the skill of the century. And it's it's really a macro skill in that if you uh, you know, there's no domain of life that this doesn't apply to, whether it's you want to exercise, you want to eat healthy, you want to uh, do well at your job, you want to have good relationships. All of these things fundamentally require the ability to be present, to do whatever it is you say you're going to do. And, uh, you know, I wrote this book first and foremost for me. I mean, I was patient zero here. I was struggling with distraction like you wouldn't believe. And I've never been the kind of person who has a lot of willpower and self-control. And that's when I figured out, you know, wow, if, if I could just have one skill, one superpower, uh, that would be it. It would be the power to be indistractable. Because I think today we all know what to do, right? Because of this miracle of the internet, who doesn't know how to get in shape? You, you go Google it if you don't know. It's all there, right? And it's not rocket science. We all pretty much know if you want to get in shape, exercise and eat right. If you want to have good relationships, be fully present with people. If you want to do well at your job, do the hard work, especially the stuff that other people don't want to do. So there's no longer this excuse of having an information gap. We all basically know what to do. What we don't know how to do is how to stop doing the things that take us off track. How do we stop right. getting distracted? And right. that was it's, absolutely yeah. my problem. Yeah, yeah, that's such a good point. Like how to not do the things that you don't want to do or not to do the things, the things that are getting in the way of doing what you want to do. Right, right. And, and I feel like that's not something that we're really taught to uh, how to do. Uh, you know, we, we, when we teach children in school, it's, you know, it's the, it's the to do list method, do this, do this, do this, do this. That's kind of how we're all raised. And even when it comes to productivity circles, right, to get things done, that's the secret, put things on a to do list. And I actually think that for most people, uh, to do lists backfire that that methodology uh, really does hurt people. I call it the tyranny of the to-do list because you know this is what I have, used to happen to me all day. I would have this to-do list of a bunch of things I need to get done. And uh, every day I wouldn't get done all those things. And so I would recycle them from one day to the next, to the next, to the next. And so every day what you're doing is reinforcing a self-image of someone who doesn't do what they say they're going to do. Someone who right. is not capable of self-efficacy of, of, of so, so what happens is when you reinforce that identity day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, that, that daily process of saying, you see, you didn't do what you said you're going to do, loser. Yeah. You begin yes. to accept it, right? That every day, if you don't do what you say you're going to do, that's another day that you, you live uh, without self-efficacy. And so instead of that methodology, there's a much better way to do things, uh, which I describe it in the book, Indistractable, which is about time boxing, essentially, understanding how we're spending our time so that at the end of every time box, no matter what it is you do, even if it's, I want to sit here for two hours and watch a movie on Netflix. Awesome. That becomes what you said you're going to do. That becomes the thing that you're going to make sure that you're going to, going to focus on is just enjoy that movie without worrying about what's on your to-do list or uh, the work left undone or the dishes needing to get done or whatever. You're just going to do that task without distraction. And that method, actually, if we can apply it to the, all the domains of our life, whether it's doing our work or exercise or being with our kids, whatever it might be, when that becomes the only metric, not finishing like we do with the to-do list method, but in fact, just doing whatever it is we said we're going to do for as long as we said we would do it without distraction, that is a much better way to, to live. And funny enough, people who do that are actually more productive. They finish more than the people who use the to-do list method. So how does time boxing work? Do you, do you do it the day before? Do you do it the day of? Because I, a lot of people ask me, like, do you have a to-do list? Do you time block your schedule? Do you, like, people ask me that all the time. And I, I do time block, but I do it <laughs> I do it kind of as I go. So this is probably not the recommended method, but it kind of works for me, but it works for me at this moment, not when the kids are in school, not like in pandemic world, this is working for yeah. me. But how do you recommend that someone institutes time box, blocking boxing? You said box, right? I call it time boxing, some kind of time blocking. It's not a new method. It's actually been studied in thousands of studies. Uh, the, the psychologists call it making an implementation intention. 
That's just a fancy way of saying planning out what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. And, and I want to be very clear that becoming indistractable is an iterative process. It's not like if you don't do everything I tell you to do, then it's all or nothing. It's not binary. It's something that we learn over time, kind of like how we uh, learn to become more creative or we learn an art. You're never done, right? You never say, ah, I'm creative. Give me, you know, check my box. Give me the degree that says you are creative. It never happens that way, right? It's a skill we develop. Same goes for being indistractable. So where some people start is by planning out an afternoon, right? Uh, that's oftentimes what I advise folks to say, look, take a weekend, right? When you don't have a lot of the commitments that you normally do during a work, uh, work day and just plan out an afternoon, right? What would planning out an afternoon on a weekend look like? And, and the way we start, we start with our values. Val hey, hey, cutie. <laughs> I'm just seeing Kristen's daughter over there. <laughs> She's adorable. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, oh, wait, I so didn't see her. Oh, there she is. Oh, yeah, hello. she's so cute. <laughs> uh, that's a good distraction. That's good. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's worth it. Um, so the way we, we the way we plan our day essentially is by starting with our values. Everything has to start with our values. And so, how do we understand our values? Instead of asking folks uh, to say, "Okay, list out all your values," I think that's a very, very difficult thing to do. Instead, what we want to do is to ask ourselves, "Well, what, what is the definition of values? What does that mean?" The definition of values are the attributes of the person you want to become. The attributes of the person you want to become. So then what we can do is to say, okay, if these are the attributes of the person I want to become, how would the person I want to become spend their time? And then what we can do is to look at three, what I call life domains. So we have these life domains at the center is you. The next domain outside of that, the kind of concentric circles is your relationships. The third life domain is your work. So you, your relationships, your work. And then for each of those three life domains, what we can do is to ask ourselves, how would the person I want to become spend their time? And then we can basically just take that calendar and we can, and you can use a you know, paper calendar. Uh, there's an online tool I can, I can uh, send you the link for that I built that's totally free. Anyone can use any kind of calendaring tool. Calendaring tool. And then what we wanna do is to start with that first life domain of you, asking yourself, how would the person I want to become spend their time investing in myself? So that means proper sleep, right? We tell our kids they have to have a bedtime, but do we take our own advice? Do we have a bedtime? Uh, when it comes to time for exercise, when it comes to time for learning, uh, enrichment, meditation, meditation, uh, a prayer, uh, painting, whatever it is that you do to invest in yourself, even I want to play a video game. Great. If that's time that you invest in yourself and that's according helps you live according to the values of the person you want to become, do it. But put that time in your calendar. Then the relationships domain. How much time would the person I want to become spend on time with my spouse, my uh, talking to my parents, playing with my kids, having time with my friends? That's the next concentric circle. So we want to put that time in our calendar as well. Don't leave it up to spontaneity. It's not going to happen. <laughs> put that time in your calendar. And, and put it on autopilot. So for example, if you have a couple really good friends in your life, say, you know what? Every Tuesday, 5 p.m., let's do a Zoom call. Uh, whether it's checking in with your parents or playing with your kids or friends, whatever it might be, have that time booked on autopilot so you know you can get that time with the people who are most important to you in your life. And then finally, the work domain. And, and when it comes to work, there's, there's really two types of work. There's what we call reactive work and reflective work. Reactive work is the emails, the Slack notifications, the meetings, all of the things that we have to react to. And that tends to be most of what people do throughout their day. They're constantly reacting, you know, one thing to the next to the next. Whereas that tends to crowd out the most important work, which is reflective work. Time for long-term thinking, strategizing, uh, uh, being uh, uh, creative problem solving, that kind of stuff requires reflection. You cannot do it on the fly. And in fact, the more reactive tasks interrupt you during your day, the less you have the ability to actually focus and do one thing well at a time and actually reflect. So make sure you have time booked in your day for that reflective work as well. And so what we're going to do is just going to fill up that calendar. And, and the, the, the reason this technique is so effective is because it helps us work under constraints that we know constraints can actually improve our performance, right? That people think, oh, when I have nothing scheduled in my day, oh, I feel free, I can do anything, I'm gonna get so much done. 
and those tend to be your least productive days. Right. If the days those are the happen, days you end up binge watching something and you really hate yourself because your to-do list is really amazing. exactly because oh, I'll get to it. I'll get to it at some point. I got all day, and that's yeah. why people are struggling today because when we work from home, we don't have oh you have to be at the office at nine a.m. We don't have that structure of I have to drop off the kids. We we don't have the, that kind of rigidity in our life, and so now we're all kind of aimlessly wondering why we don't feel productive, it's because we are, we're missing that structure. Well, you don't have to have the workplace impose the structure, you can impose that structure on yourself. And so having those constraints limits you to say, okay, there are only so many hours in a day, how will I prioritize what I'm going to do? As opposed to the to-do list method, which I hate, which is just put everything on a to-do list, just put it all on a to-do list. Right. But that's ri ridiculous because that's just a list of output, but you can't have output without input. The input, of course, is the time. So putting things on a calendar says to you, okay, well, pretty clearly, I'm not going to have time to do everything. What will I prioritize for this day or this week? And so that process is, is very, very beneficial to make sure that you do the important things and actually get them done. So before you do your time boxing, do you have, and this is not a to-do list, but do you have like a master list that you pull your priorities from so I mean like for example I, I if I want to write a book this year and I need to, like do you have a list of goals that you then you know structure those time boxes from like how do you keep up with the major to-do list I guess without making it a to-do list yeah so okay so if there are steps like a, a a checklist that needs to be followed you know don't forget to do this and I need to do that I need to do this that's fine to keep somewhere, but don't let that be what what uh, don't let that be your taskmaster okay. for the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you say, "Oh, there's a hundred steps to writing a book," let me make sure I remember. Oh, at, you know, when it's at this stage, remember to do this thing. That's fine. You can have a list of all the things that need to get done, but don't make that your daily yeah, punch yeah, yeah. list. Yeah, yeah, right? gotcha. Um, and if you do have those things that do need to get done quickly, what you want to do is as quickly as possible, move them from the to-do list. I, I do use a list, but it's as temporary as possible. The idea is that when I put something there, I put it so I won't forget it, but immediately right. it has to go into my calendar somewhere it's or like someplace where I will see when it's important. Just use the example of if you go to the grocery store and you buy all your groceries, the to-do list is like a, a bag of the really tasty snacks. They're going to get eaten first. <laughs> and you're, and you're not going to have them around for long. Um, Todd has his hand up. You good to take a question here? Please. Yeah. Todd, do you have a question? Yeah. So how do you handle a boss that's totally reactionary, even though you're trying to time time block and, you know, control your time my boss is really bad at like if he can't get a response by email he picks up the phone and calls me yeah, yeah. i mean and then you go this is not urgent and then and then <laughs> yeah. the other the, so she can mute me um the, the other question is electronic versus paper like with the time blocking is it better to use like outlook or do you prefer to use like a, a traditional paper planner yeah, so uh, with, the, with the second question, it's whatever format you like. Uh, so I keep my calendar in Google Calendar. Uh, some people complain that it's, it's kind of clunky, and I have to admit that at first it is kind of clunky to get started with a, a calendar. Use whatever you're most comfortable with. I, I'll, I'll put a link in here. Uh, here, let me just type this in real quick. Uh, I think that should work. Uh, I just put it in the chat function here. Uh, wait, did I get that right? I'll yes. look for it. I'll look for it. Yeah. I'll post it up in the notes too. Okay. It, yeah, that, that link I just, I, so that's a tool I built totally free. Anyone can use it. It's super easy uh, because I found that the existing tools were overbuilt. Uh, so that's a tool I built that you can basically put out your, your calendar and print it out for you. If you don't clear your cookies in your browser, that it'll stay there for you, so you can come back and make adjustments to it in the future. But people use, uh, you know, Microsoft. They use uh, they use uh, Google. Any you know, paper planner, whatever it is that's easy for you. The the more important lesson here is that your schedule, your time box calendar, you shouldn't look at it as something that you know you need to be a drill sergeant and say, oh, you you have to do this, and then you have to do this. And then. That's not the right mental frame. The right the right mental frame is to think of yourself as a scientist. So that you're going to plan out a week's time, but then the most important thing you can plan is the time 
to reevaluate that calendar. So for me, it's every Sunday, I sit down and I say, okay, what is the week ahead going to look like? So I'm gonna look at the past week and say, mm, you know what, I didn't, I didn't budget enough time for email or I didn't, I want more time with my kid or I want you know, less time for this or that. And then in the week ahead, I'm going to adjust that. But then once I say, yep, that's my calendar, well, now I'm gonna to stick to it. Okay, but the idea is to reevaluate it week over week so that you're refining it so that by, by now I've been doing this for so long, I make only small changes uh, or you know, unless something happens like this current uh, work from home uh, situation. Okay, so now it does need to have some big changes because there's been a massive life change. But you, know, you, you have to make very little changes over time when you use it more often because you begin to kind of optimize what your day looks like. And for most people, our days don't change that much from week to week. With your question around your boss, that's a terrific question. And uh, it's a really important reason why in Indistractable, about half the book is about stuff you can do for yourself, okay? It's about following these four steps of mastering the internal trigger, making time for traction, hacking back the external trigger, and preventing distraction with packs. Those are the four things that you can do for yourself to become indistractable right now. The second half of the book acknowledges that, look, even if you're indistractable, we work and live with other people, and other people can distract us. Our kids can distract us. Our significant other, our boss can all distract us. In fact, uh, it, one, of, one of the surveys that I looked at uh, when I wrote the book found that the number one source of distraction in the modern American workplace is not your phone, it's not your computer, it's not, it's not apps, it's other people. 80% of people said the number one source of distraction was other people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in a way, if there's a, if there's a silver lining to, to, to what's going on right now with the corona crisis is that at least we don't have the colleague t- touching us on the so- shoulder or in an open yes, floor plan office they're constantly just 12 distracted. years old. They're just, <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> they're just little. <laughs> okay. They're worse. Well, exactly. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to talk about what to do about kids in a minute. But when it comes to our workplace, um, we need to acknowledge that it is not necessarily the technology that is the problem, right? As you said, Todd, if your boss calls you uh, at 8 p.m. when you're having dinner with your family and says, Todd, I need you to do something right now, it's not the phone that your boss is using that's the problem. It's the fact that your boss accepts a a crappy culture, right? That 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 company culture perpetuates the acceptance that that's okay. So what we need to remember is that distraction in the workplace is a symptom of cultural dysfunction. Distraction in the workplace is a symptom of cultural dysfunction. And and so what we find is, what the research shows us is that the real problem is when we can't talk about the problem. That is actually the source of the problem. That like everything else in the workplace, if people can't raise their hand and say, hey, you know what, This, this always being on, this fact that I have no time to do my reflective work, the fact that I can't have any focused time that I'm constantly on call, it's degrading my work performance. I'm not able to deliver the value that I know I could deliver to the company. Can we talk about this? Can we make some changes? Can we set some, some, some ground rules around how we're going to communicate with each other so that I can deliver my best performance to you and the company? Where people can't talk about that because they fear they're going to get fired, that's where we have the problem. And so that, this is called psychological safety. And the lack of psychological safety is endemic to every single company who has had a corporate disaster whether it comes to uh, Boeing with the, the 737 MAX disaster or all the way back to Enron and Tyco, every one of these companies had people in the company who couldn't raise their hand because they knew that something was going wrong and they couldn't talk about it because they were afraid of getting fired. So that's the real source of the problem. And so how do we change company culture? It's not easy. Uh, it's not something that happens with a, with a snap of a finger. One of the things that we can do is to start leading by example, even if we are managing our manager. And how do we do that? So one of the the beneficial outcomes of having a time box calendar is that you can you have a physical artifact, right? You can print up your schedule, and you can show it to your manager, and you can say, "Okay, boss, check this out. Here is how I'm spending my time." And by the way, most managers will worship the ground you walk on if you do this, because let's face it, most managers have no idea how their staff is spending their time. They just you know send over a bunch of to dos. And they have no idea how are they, how, you know, is this too much? Is this too little? They have no clue. So if you send to your manager your time box calendar and you say, look, here's how I'm spending my nine to five for you, 
You see all this time, okay, I'm doing this task, then I'm gonna do this task, I'm gonna have some time for email, then I'm gonna have the meetings, et cetera. Here's how I'm spending my time. Now you see this list over here, this other piece of paper? I've written down all the things I don't have a place to put in my calendar. So will you help me reprioritize? Some of the worst advice out there that you hear about making sure that you don't get distracted, making sure that you can stay focused, is to learn how to say no, right? We've all heard this advice. Learn how to say no. Seriously, you're going to tell your boss, the person who cuts your checks, hey, boss, no, I don't want to do that. That's the stupidest advice I've ever heard. You can't say that. You're going to get fired. Instead of you being the one that says no, make your boss be the one that says no, meaning you show them your calendar, you show them the things that you don't know where to prioritize, and you say, hey, look, boss, can you help me reprioritize this stuff over here that you said you needed to get done? What should I take out of my calendar to make sure I can do that? And so now they're the one reprioritizing your calendar for you. And that process of having a time box calendar, this takes 15 minutes a week, really, 15 minutes a week sitting down with your boss virtually, you know, saying, okay, here's how I'm going to spend my time in the week ahead. Help me reprioritize if there's anything that shouldn't that should be there or shouldn't be on there. That's incredibly effective, and it helps communicate the time you need for focused work. So if Todd, you say, "Hey, look, you see here, boss, in my calendar, I need from two to four to do my my deep thinking. This is where I need to do my focused work." Well, now your boss knows. Oh, okay, maybe I shouldn't call Todd during that time because that's when he needs some focus in his day. That's helpful. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm laughing. At, I know Todd very well. I'm like, oh, what you think, what you going to do during that deep thinking time? <laughs> <laughs> How's that sound, Todd? Tell me how that resonates. Uh, no, I like it. You think it could work? Yeah, I think so. Um, the, the interesting thing, though, is like I work for the government. And the fear of uh, speaking up is not an issue with me. <laughs> because, no, it's not an issue. That's good. Um, yeah, but it, it, it the, the managing up is the, the hardest part because, you know, government is so set and to change a culture is, is very difficult, I think, in a, in a government situation. Right. And, and that's true. Look, I'm not naive enough to say that you have to change the, co the company culture at your organization. Uh, but we, we need to realize that that the reason the company that the reason that people find themselves so distracted is a cultural dysfunction issue. Uh, that many companies that use a lot of technology, lots of beeps and boops, and you know, I, I, in the book I profile Slack, right? The company that makes right. the technology that everybody complains is distracting them. They're not distracted at Slack because they <laughs> have this company culture. When you walk into the the, the company headquarters. In big red letters, they have printed on the wall, it says, work hard and go home. And people know that you are not supposed to use Slack on nights and weekends. It is part of the company culture. If you do, you're reprimanded. You're told, don't be on Slack on nights and weekends. We don't do that here. Why? Because it's a company culture issue. And so again, it's, it's not easy to change. The best thing, if you manage people, well, you, you, you can change, right? You can show people, hey, look, you know, this is how I work. I'm indistractable. Uh, let them borrow a copy of your book so they can get up to speed as well. And you can lead by example. But you can also uh, show, uh, you know, lead by example to your managers by showing them these different techniques, like, for example, the, the time box calendar. Another thing I would mention as well that's very effective, if you find that your, your boss you know, reaches out to you all the time, after you've sent them that time box calendar, after you review, reviewed and said, look, I need a couple hours where I, I, I can't be disturbed. I need to do my focused work during this time. And I'm not saying be focused all day long. You need time in your day to do that reactive work, right? So you also need time in your day to say, look, I'm going to have office hour time or uh, time when I'm available, my virtual door is open, whatever it might be. Here's when I'm going to be on Slack. Put that time in your calendar as well. But for that focused work time, you can use certain tools. For example, on everyone's phone today, we have do not disturb while driving. And the way do not disturb while driving mode works is that if someone calls or texts you when you have do not disturb while driving on, they get an automatic reply that says, I can't talk right now, but if this is urgent, text the word urgent, and then the message will come through. Because you, re you gotta realize people interrupt each other because they have this internal trigger. They have this uncomfortable thing they need to tell you so that they can get it off their plate. And so that's fine. You can text me, but if I'm focused and it's not urgent, well, then I'm not going to get to it right away. 
If you text me with the word urgent, okay, I'll stop what I'm doing. So, okay, your boss. <laughs> I, I did get, this on my daughter, on my, on my phone and my daughter, she'll be on the bus and she'll text me urgent. And, Mom, can I get a snack when I get home? <laughs> <to> break, <laughs> so kids, okay, so maybe she doesn't understand do what it. urgent means. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's like the passcode is urgent. Can I get a cookie? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No. No, but I think so. Using tools like that can help. Can help train people to respect that time that you're indistractable. So Michelle had a question. Can you explain the triggers? And maybe we have to sure. go back a little bit to to cover that. But I think that that's that's a good thing to cover. Yeah, totally. So there are two types of triggers. Well, let me at first under, explain kind of the framework. So to understand distraction, we have to understand what is the opposite of distraction. So the opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. That both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And you'll notice that both traction and distraction end in the same six letters. They end in the word action, right? A-C-T-I-O-N. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want, things that you are doing with intent, things that pull you towards your values, the person you want to become. The opposite of traction is distraction, anything that pulls you away from what you plan to do, okay? So that's very important because anything can become distraction, anything can be traction. So if I'm playing a video game, when I plan to do my work, it's a distraction. But if I'm playing a video game, when I plan to play a video game, it's traction and there's nothing wrong with it. I should enjoy it without guilt. So we have traction, we have distraction. Now what prompts us to take these actions? What leads us towards either traction or distraction are triggers. And there are two types of triggers. We have what we call an external trigger. An external trigger is a ping, a ding, a ring, a thing, anything in our outside environment that leads us towards either traction or distraction. So if I get a notification on my phone that says, oh, it's time for this webinar, and that's what I plan to do, well, wonderful. That's an, that's an external trigger that's very helpful. But if I get a notification on my phone while I'm playing with my daughter, and now I'm checking Facebook as opposed to being fully present with her, well, now it's led me towards a distraction. So the key question with the external triggers is to ask ourselves, is this trigger serving me or am I serving it? And if, if I am serving the trigger, I need to get rid of it. Okay. It needs to be something that I, I remove the notification. I use these different, and I talk about in the book exactly how to do this. But if, it, if, if I'm serving the trigger as opposed to the trigger serving me, I got to get rid of it. Now, the external triggers are what most people think about when we think about distraction, right? Our phone rang, uh, Slack notifications, email, those are all external triggers. But what turns out to be the number one source of distraction is not the external trigger. It's not the stuff outside of us. The number one source of distraction is what's going on inside of us. It's what we call the internal trigger. An internal trigger is an uncomfortable emotional state that we seek to escape from. This is the most important thing I can teach you, that all distractions originate from an uncomfortable sensation, right? Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, fearfulness, any of these uncomfortable emotional triggers, this is why we look for escape. Whether it's too much booze, too much news, too much football, too much Facebook, it doesn't matter. It all comes from the same uncomfortable place of an uncomfortable sensation that we want to get rid of. And so for many of us, the way we get rid of that discomfort is escape, right? Uh, I'm, I feel fearful and uncertain about what's going on in the world today. Let me check the news whether it's helpful or hurtful, doesn't matter. Let me just check it to get my mind off of what's going on in my own head. Uh, I feel lonely. So instead of you know, finding a way to actually scratch that itch, let me do it in some superficial way, right? Uh, it, it, what, I'm bored. So instead of figuring out why, I'll, I'll just take my mind off of that feeling. Uh, and so that, those uncomfortable sensations have to be where we start. Not that there's anything wrong with the sensations, okay? We don't want to guilt ourselves into thinking, oh, I shouldn't be feeling bored or I shouldn't be feeling lonely or uncertain or fearful or anxious. Those are perfectly normal human sensations. And I think many of us, we put too much of a burden on our, uh, ourselves. I think uh, the, the self-help community these days, unfortunately, teaches many people that if you're not happy all the time, something's wrong with you and nothing could be further from the truth. We are built. Evolution has given us this gift of perpetual disquietude. Thank you. The, norm 
Yes. Yay, happiness <laughs> yeah. is a lie. We're being told. It's true. It's <laughs> overrated. It's happiness is fleeting. And that's how it is designed to be. If you think about it from an evolutionary basis, if there was ever a group of, of people who were happy all the time, who were contented, everything was awesome for them all the time, we would have killed and eaten them, right? They would not have survived. <laughs> you right. want a race of people who is always looking for more, who is always dissatisfied. That's what keeps us inventing and creating uh, and innovating is through this, this uncomfortable sensations that get us to do more. Now, the important thing here is to harness those uncomfortable sensations to lead us towards traction rather than distraction. Do we try and escape them in, in harmful ways or do we utilize them as rocket fuel to help us do what we really wanna do in life? And that is so hard right now. So, so, so hard because we, we all want to escape everything right now. We want to escape the, the uncertainty that's in the world. We want to escape the, some of the people that are in our house. <laughs> we want, we just, <laughs> and we can't. I mean, this is the kind of escape where you're like, oh, I literally can't. Super. Yeah. Um, so it's so important what you said about harnessing the trigger or harnessing, yeah, harnessing the internal trigger for good, not evil. <laughs> like, how can we? How can we say, okay, I can, I'm feeling weird. How can I use that to be per the person I want to be? How can I turn that into something good? And that is, look, that's not easy, but no, awareness, no. like just being aware of it is such a big step. And I, I love that everything you, you, you say in your book is about building those muscles of awareness. So we can be like, Hey, that's a, that's a trigger. It's an internal trigger. And so yeah, right. I think, I think it's and, and there are really only two things that you can do about it. I mean, there's really only two buckets. When you feel these uncomfortable sensations, you can either fix the source of the problem, which we should do, right? I think in, in many circles these days, unfortunately, uh, mindfulness and meditation is the solution to everything. <laughs> and I don't agree. Uh, look, mindfulness and meditation has a place. It can be very, very useful. But sometimes the answer is not to keep sitting on your butt and meditating. Sometimes the answer is to go fix a damn problem, right? <laughs> Do something about it should be the answer. So if we can fix the problem, if we can figure out, wait, what is causing me this anxiety, uncertainty, fear, fatigue, loneliness, let's go fix it. We should, but there are some problems that we can't solve. We can't fix every uncomfortable state. And so when we can't fix it, then, then, the solution is mindfulness, meditation, different practices that we can use. And I talk about those very little in my book, just not because they don't work, but just because they've been covered ad nauseum by other books. Uh, but there are other techniques that we can use. For example, I talk about the 10 minute rule. The 10 minute rule says that you can give in to any temptation, whether it's that piece of chocolate cake, whether it's the cigarette, whether it's checking social media, whether it's watching the news when you know you should be doing something else, you can give in to any temptation you want in 10 minutes. And I didn't make up this technique. This comes from acceptance and commitment therapy. It's been a very effective technique. I use it all the time. And I tell myself, okay, I can give into that temptation in just 10 minutes of what we call surfing the urge. Surfing the urge acknowledges that these internal triggers, these uncomfortable emotional states, they crest and then they subside, kind of like a wave. Even though in the moment, it feels like we're going to stay with them forever when we feel bad. We don't, that's not always true, that these sensations, they kind of come and they go. So if we can be with that sensation, and many times I'll say, okay, I really feel like checking the news right now. I'm going to check the news in just 10 minutes. And I'll take my phone, I'll say, set a timer for 10 minutes, I'll put it down. And my job is to either get back to the task at hand, whether it's, you know, whatever was on my, on my schedule, whatever's on my time box schedule, whether it was writing or I don't know, whatever it is that I said I'm, I'm going to do for that period of time, I can either get back to it or I'm just gonna sit with it, okay? I'm gonna sit with it and acknowledge, yep, I'm feeling uncertain, I'm feeling fearful. Let me feel that sensation in my body. I'm gonna explore it with curiosity rather than contempt. I'm not gonna get angry at myself for feeling it this way because it's not my, I, I can't control how I feel. I can only control how I respond to my feelings, hence the word responsibility. And what we find is that in just a few minutes of saying, I can give in in just 10 minutes of surfing the urge, nine times out of 10, by the time the 10 minutes are up, you will have already gotten back to the task at hand. Yeah, that's such great. I, I tell all my life clients that 10 minute rule too. Like that's it's super great, effective, right? especially with, with the big ones, like the, the binge eating, the, the super hard overcomers, like that's really big. Like, especially if you're in recovery and you're like, okay, I'm going to give myself 10 minutes. 
it will pass and, and it's such good advice. So Kristen had a question yeah. and I think you gave some good advice. How do you adjust mentally and emotionally when something comes up? How do you handle the loss of control? And I think that 10 minute was good advice for that, but do you have any um, other advice on, and, and I don't know if you mean um, the loss of control, like after the fact or the feeling of losing control? Um, not really sure. I don't know, Chris. Are you still on? Let's see. The feeling of losing control. Like, you mean like right before you lose control? Sorry, I'm just trying to get her. I just want to make sure. Can you see me? Yeah. yeah. Are you on? Oh, good. Hi. I'm sorry. I'm like hiding put you on spots. in my bedroom. <laughs> I'm hiding <laughs> out. So, <laughs> the feeling of like in that moment, I'm a it doesn't matter. I'm not going to believe the point, but I'm a physician and I get pulled like multiple places, especially right now in this, obviously we all feel a little out of control, but I'm, I really feel pulled so much. I can make a schedule. I can do intentions to Meredith every morning, but in that moment of when I get pulled by a nurse, pulled by a patient, pulled, I, I'm having trouble with the with that in the moment so that was my question yeah. thanks Preston. Well, well first of all i mean you you are the the hero of our age right now thank you so much for the work you do i mean i think mm -hmm. the the entire world is thankful to have people like you on the front lines i mean you are our uh you, you are the soldier of, of this age right now so thank you for the work you're doing helping all of us get through this um and and i think you know if if i can be i'm not, you know, your job is one where you have mostly uh, reactive work. Yeah. I'm guessing very little of your day is that reflective work that maybe a knowledge worker, uh, most of their day, right? If you're, if you're a, a computer engineer, your day is all uh, reflective time. You need that focus work time to write code. In your job, uh, your job is largely reactive work. It, that is a big part of what you do is going, okay, where am I supposed to be? Go, 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 go to the next thing, to the next thing. And, you know, especially in these times when much of, of the work physicians are doing is, is triaging and figuring out, you know, what priorities are constantly changing. It is much a much more reactive work type of job. I would say that, you know, part of it is acknowledging that that is, part of, that is a big part of the role, that 90% of your day is going to be reactive work. And then for the part of your day that is not reactive, the reflective work time, that's when these techniques kick in. Okay. To, to, I think give, it's okay to give up control for 90% of your day that you acknowledge, look, my job is to be reactive. But for the 10% of my day that I need time to think, I need time to get my head together, I need time to plan, I need time to, to think about how we can do what we're doing better, that needs to be religiously protected. Okay. Uh, and just and just try and get control over that 10% of your day or whatever percentage of your day that you need that 30 minutes, an hour, 45 minutes, whatever amount of time you need. Okay, now that needs to be, uh, you know, religiously protected so that you can get your head on straight. That's and great. one of the things like I've mentioned to Kristen, I was like, since you were working, you know, 15 hours a day, and it's all on fire. Like if you can take five minutes each hour, yeah. drink your water, lay down like just sit like whatever you can grab and and take five minutes every hour like if that's all you can do you know finding that space because I, I don't even know if you have 45 minutes <laughs> to mm -hmm. give and mm -hmm. I'm honored you're on this call I would I mean and not sleeping but <laughs> I just um, set an intention to do this this was my one intention for the day was to make this call <laughs> oh, I'm so honored I'm so honored, but we love you, Kristen, and keep hanging Thank in there. Thank you, you for what you're it. doing. Thank you. Um, one of Beth's questions was, what is the best way to build a time box schedule when self-employed and your whole family is now working and schooling from home? Yeah, yeah. So schedules become even more important now that we have kids at home. And uh, this is an area I actually have a lot of experience in because we've been homeschooling now for the past five, six years, my daughter. Uh, so we, we, so this is, you know, welcome to my, our world, everybody. <laughs> we've been, we've been doing it for a while. And I'll tell you that without a schedule, it's maddening. And I mean, getting the whole family on a schedule, because that's the only way we can synchronize our schedules. So we want to make sure that when our, uh, when we need time to do our work, our kids have something to do. So they don't bother us during that time so that they don't become the distraction from, from our time. And so depending on the age of your child, we started homeschooling when our daughter was uh, in first grade uh, and, and now she's in uh, sixth grade. 
uh, or would be in sixth grade. And uh, from day one, we, we kept this calendar and involved her in making that schedule. So even a child of, of five, six years old can sit down and, and, you know, with a piece of paper and we could say, okay, how do you want to spend your day? We have, we need some time for schoolwork. We, do you want to talk to grandma and grandpa over Skype for a little while? Do you, do you want to watch a few, a little bit of television? Do you, you know, whatever it might be, uh, when are you going to have time for some physical activity? You know, we want to make sure we involve them in their day to create that schedule. Uh, so certainly kids in, in uh, middle school, high school can do this. And also kids in, in uh, elementary school can do this as well. And then coordinating that schedule to say, okay, while you're going to play video games in the evening, that's when mommy or daddy is going to do a little bit of work. Or while you're talking to grandma and grandpa, that's when I'm going to do my work. Now, one of the questions I get all the time is what do we do when our kids, when we're trying to do work and our kids interrupt us, Okay. And the reason this is so difficult in the home environment is that your kids can't tell when you are trying to focus. They don't know when you are indistractable. And so what you have to do is to send a clear signal to them. So what I want you to do is to find something funny you can put on your head. <laughs> this is going to sound crazy, but there's a picture in the book where I talk about how my wife has what we call the concentration crown. And it's this little thing on Amazon. It's like this wreath, this plastic wreath that has lights on it, LED lights. And she turns it on and you can't miss it. Okay, the idea, <laughs> I mean, you could put a funny hat. Uh, you could put a colander on your head. I don't care. Put something on your head that your kids can't help but seeing before they open their mouth. Then they know, oh, when daddy is wearing that funny hat, when mommy is <laughs> wearing that concentration crown, that means she cannot be interrupted. So that you're blocking that that desire to to talk to you because now they know. Oh, okay. When I see that, that means don't interrupt. By the way, it works really good on kids. It also works really well on significant others, on husbands and wives too. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> many times say, like <laughs> apparently, the flames I shoot from my eyes have not been working. So. <laughs> <laughs> because by then you're already distracted, right? So if right. you have to turn to yes. your child and say, "I'm working right now. Please go away." It's too yeah. late. You've already broken your focus. But when you put something on your head that they can't miss, they know you can't be interrupted. And then they say, oh, sorry. Okay, I'll go away. I must have missed that in your book or I skimmed over it and forgot it. I need a crown so bad right now. That's yeah, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, one thing I wanted to say that I use, and I don't know if this is in your book or if I made this up, but um, to, when you, especially when you work from home, but I have what I like to call an anchor box, which is um, something I do every day, like in perpetuity. And, it, and I anchor my day around that. And whether it's like a workout or um, right now it's these daily meetings because uh, on the weekend they're at eight, but on the weekday they're at 12. And so like by having, if you have a willy nilly structure, right? And everything's up in the air, if, especially for Beth since you're working from home, like if, and I know you're on these meetings a lot. So if you just anchor your day around, <laughs> around that, it helps. It helps to say, okay, well, I have to be bathed. <laughs> this helps yeah. tell me when to bathe. <laughs> really Absolutely. Awesome. No, I think I think that's a great idea. And especially if we can have some accountability. So there's a website called focusmate.com here. I'll, I'll uh, type it in here as well. Uh, focusmate.com is a company I like so much. I actually invested in the company. Uh, and it's such, it's such a great idea. Basically, what you do is you go into this website when you want to do focused work and you book a time with another person who also wants to do focused work. And so in that time, you're matched with them. And you just, it's just one-on-one. -on -one. You see them, they see you over, over this little video conference. And you say, okay, hi, my name is Nir. I'm working on such and such, go. And for the rest of that time block, all you have to do is do whatever it is you said you were going to do. And they do the same. And it's amazing how just having another person, they, they can't see your screen, but just knowing that that other person is working on something they need to stay focused for, and that that's what you're doing as well, is incredibly uh, uh, effective at helping you stay focused. And even if you don't use focus mate, you know, this is a great technique to use with your kids, right? If you can find that, that other parent in your kid's classroom and say, look, you know, now that we're in this tricky situation, can we get the kids to do their work virtually at the same time? Now, they're not going to talk and chit chat. All they're going to do is say, okay, we're going to set the timer for 45 minutes. And for 45 minutes, we're all going to work on this same thing, you know, virtually. It's, it can be a, a very effective technique to help people stay on task. It's called social proof or social pressure can be, can be very, very effective. I feel like you just gave me a great idea for a novel too. Like these two people during the pandemic meet on Focusmate, focus work <laughs> every day. 
<laughs> it's uh, it's particularly good, by the way, if you're a person like I am. So my big problem when, when it comes to fighting distraction was always getting started. Okay, I would say, okay, 9 a.m. I'm going to start. I'm, that's when I'm going to start my hard work. That's when I'm doing my, my focused work. 9.15, 9.30 would roll around. And I still hadn't gotten to work. Well, when you have a focus mate or when you have someone else who's, who's there keeping you accountable, you got to show up because they're going to be mad at you if you didn't come to come on time. Yeah, so great. So great. Well, we just have a few more minutes. We can probably take one more question if anyone has one. But this this book, Nier, is so, so great. Um, I knew I needed to turn off my notifications on my phone. I knew I needed to do all these things, but I didn't really have a good enough reason why. And your book allowing me to see that this is this stuff is legitimately getting in the way of me being the person I want to be. And I t the first night I turned off all the notifications because I don't get any social media notifications anymore. Um, I, I kept looking at my phone like... <laughs> Are you working? Because yeah. I, I mean, it was this lonely feeling, but it also made me realize that internal trigger, which was yeah. either boredom or loneliness, which I really shouldn't be bored. But um, yeah, it, it's such a powerful thing to change, change these distractions. So I'm very grateful to you for writing this book. And I'm oh, bummed our pleasure. New York event got canceled, but yeah, but this is great. I'm glad we got to take some questions. Yeah. yeah and I, I, th I think the important message here is too, I think, you know, a lot of people are struggling with this idea that you know technology is the problem, and I think for many people that makes the problem worse, uh, because we 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 look at it as either what I call blamers, right? Blamers say, "Oh, it's this device that's doing it to me. It's Facebook. It's Instagram. It's you know, it's it's the modern world these days doing it to me." Well, that's not very effective because you can't change that stuff. We're not, you know, these companies aren't going to go out of business and go away. Uh, so blaming the outside world isn't helpful. And then the other side of the spectrum are people we call shamers. The shamers, they don't blame things outside themselves. They shame themselves. They say, oh, you know what? Look at me. I can't get this under control. Maybe I, there's something wrong with me. I have a short attention span. You see, I'm lazy. There's, here I go again. And they shame themselves, which makes the problem worse because the worse we feel about ourselves, the more internal triggers we feel and the more likely we are to get distracted, to seek escape through distraction. So that doesn't work either. So we don't want to be blamers. We don't want to be shamers. We want to be claimers. Claimers claim responsibility, not over how we feel, but how we respond to those feelings. So when we feel bored, anxious, lonely, uncertain, do we have these new habits that can lead us towards helpful traction as opposed to harmful distraction? And so that's really what we're trying to cultivate. It's not about, you know, I want people to watch Netflix. I want people to go on social media. It's fun. It's great. There's nothing wrong with it. But again, to do it on your schedule, not on some big company schedule. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Nir, thank you so much. Um, his website is Nir, N-I-R and far .com, And I'll post the links to his book, Indistractable, um, up on the show notes when I do the replay episode. But thank you so much and um, stay well. And we will thank see, you. we will get together whenever this is all settled down. Absolutely. I look forward to it. And if, by the way, anyone, if, if there was questions I didn't get to, if you just go to my website and, and send me, a, if there's a contact form there, if there's any questions I didn't get to today, happy to, uh, to address them uh, awesome. if, you, if you just send me an email. Awesome. Thanks, Nir. Take care, All everyone. All right. My pleasure. Tomorrow night. Bye, everyone. Okay. Have Bye. a great day. Bye.